Okay, so today we're going to talk about centering background, um, and uh, this sort of picks up from where we were last time. And where we were last time, we were talking about trying to get rid of all that binder. So we worked really hard to get the binder in, and then we have to work really hard to get the binder out. And I'm um, assuming that's where we're at, and that we don't have any organic left behind. We've been successful in removing that, that potential source of carbon from the ceramic matrix. We can now think about sintering. And um, so we're going to talk about the, the many different types of sintering that happen in these systems. And as you all hopefully know, that this is all driven by the surface area involved. And the surface area is atoms sitting on the surface that would rather not be there. Um, and um, that drives processes. And sometimes it doesn't always drive them in a good direction. And we'll talk about some of that. Um, and how industry has tried to adapt to that to provide, again, the best properties we can possibly get, which means eliminating as much porosity as we possibly can from these systems. So, from there, we want to talk about surface energy. And uh, this relates to what atoms will tend to do when they're placed in these configurations, and these represent configurations that exist when we have a bunch of typically very small particles in the system. And so um, you guys should all know that when we have a surface, that surface always consists of atoms, and those atoms there at that surface in this nice flat configuration are going to be unhappy because they are, they are experiencing a bunch of unsatisfied bonds. All right, That's what makes water absorb onto them and anything else that's in the environment. So these guys are, are higher energy. And the system as a whole would like to get rid of them. And that's what, that's what drives everything we're talking about today, is trying to get rid of atoms that are at a higher energy state. And this is how that we look at this as an overall system trying to minimize its energy. And the point to make here is that when we look at these flat surfaces, if we say this is atom A, he's got one, two, three, four neighbors. All right, so in this 2D configuration, we think of him as being uh, uh, definitely a higher energy state than uh, some other atom down here, which has one, two, three, four, five, six atoms around it, okay? So that atom there, atom X, is gonna have a lower energy than atom A. All right, that should, that's something we, we've seen a lot of, hopefully already, in material science. And so that's, that's one case. That's the p naught case that we talked about where you have a nice flat surface. If we come over here, things are considerably worse here for atom B because he's only got two neighbors, all right? The more neighbors, the better, all right? The more neighbors, the lower the surface energy. And atom B has a lot more uh, unsatisfied dangling bonds than atom A does, all right? So we know that atom B is at a higher energy state all right, so he's more likely to do stuff. He's more likely to react. He's more likely to evaporate, as it turns out. We'll talk about that. He's more likely to try to leave that state because he's already partially up the activation energy curve. All right, he's not just sitting down here at the valley. He's already moving up because of his position in that lattice or barely being in that lattice. And then we think about one of the alternatives. So if we have Adam C down here, he's got one, two, three, four, five. All right, so he's better off than Adam B and better off than Adam A, but still not as good as, as Adam X, all right, where you have six neighbors around it. And so we can think about you know, the energy state um, of these systems in a relative sense in that uh, B has a higher energy, whoa, hold still. B has a higher energy than A, all right, and uh, A has a higher energy than C, all right. And so we know in terms of energetics that B is more likely to do something than A, which is more likely to do something than C, um, but ideally they're all, well, they all like to be X. Let's just make that clear.
first time in like 50 years that OSU ever closed because of like winter weather? It's happened several like times really since cold, I've been here. Like two or three years ago. Really, yeah, yeah really cold. Why they closed it? Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's a Friday, so it's like, eh, it's a gi it's a gimme. Isn't tomorrow supposed to be the worst thing? Yeah. Tomorrow's supposed to be really snowy, yeah, but it's not that cold. And it's supposed to. Oh, Friday's supposed to be cold. Yeah, it drops to like five degrees or something like that. Oh. Five. I believe what one. Yeah, mine says one. Okay. Yeah, Melissa says one. Yeah, so uh, I would bet that the powers that be are going to say, eh, it's, it's Friday. It's supposed to like freeze everything. Not just like snow, but like ice over everything. Yeah, so ice, we have ice first and then 10 inches of snow. Is that still the forecast? Okay, and then, and then, then it gets bloody cold after that. <laughs> so we'll see if we have class or not. Oh, so yeah, if, if we do have class, it's going to be the 10th lecture, right? Yeah, 10th lecture. So the exam would normally be a week from Friday. If that if that's an issue, uh, if a class gets canceled, it'll get bumped to Monday. Any questions, concerns, conflicts? That's the main thing I'm worried about. Does anybody have test conflicts for next week or the following Monday? I don't think so. Not on Monday, no. Not on Monday, but Friday? No Friday evening? Okay. No. All right. Just stay tuned. We'll see what happens to the schedules. All right, see you guys maybe on Friday, <laughs> uh, certainly Monday.